Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of AFSIA International and the U.S. Naval Institute, welcome back to San Diego for West 2022. Before we begin this morning's program, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. First, we remind you that all un excuse me, unvaccinated participants are required and all participants are strongly encouraged to wear face coverings while at West Conference events. Thank you for protecting the health of your fellow attendees this week. Please refer to the health and safety plan on the event website for the full list of requirements and recommendations. If you think you may be exhibiting COVID symptoms, we ask that you stop by the first aid office in the lobby of Hall E and also notify a staff member immediately. The U.S. Naval Institute and AFSIA are grateful to Hitachi Vantara Federal for their sponsorship of the upcoming keynote session. They are represented today by John Gaines, Strategic Partner Executive. If you have not already done so, make sure to download the event app sponsored by Deloitte. The link in the QR code can be found on page two of the show guide. The app is the best place to get the latest West information and updates. If you have additional questions that you can't find in the app, be sure to stop by the Operations Center, located in the 1900 aisle of the exhibit hall. The Operations Center is your one-stop venue to get your event questions answered. At the conclusion of this morning's keynote and all other sessions throughout the conference, please complete, complete the session survey located in each session within the app. We appreciate your feedback. We would like to recognize the many sponsoring companies who help make it possible to bring this important event to San Diego. We would especially like to acknowledge West's premier sponsors, Fincantieri Marine Group, GDIT, and Lockheed Martin. Now, please stand for the presentation of retirement Retirement of the Colors by the Naval Base San Diego Color Guard and the playing of the National Anthem.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, please join me in welcome to the stage, Vice Admiral Peter Daly, U.S. Navy retired, Chief Executive Officer and Publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. Good morning. Well, welcome to West 2022, and it's great to be back in person. I'd like a show of hands of people who are ready to be back in person. Thank you. Um, we're grateful to Hitachi Ventara Federal for their support of this opening keynote, and they're represented here today by Mr. John Gaines, who's a strategic partner executive at Hitachi Ventara Federal. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Admiral Harry Harris served as the commander of the Pacific Fleet from 2015, excuse me, from 2013 to 2015, and that was followed by command of the U.S. Pacific Command before it changed names. He retired from active duty in 2018, left that job, and was appointed the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. He's a 1978 Naval Academy grad, put on his wings as an NFO the next year, and he commanded BP-46, commanded the Patrol and Reconnaissance Wing 1, was the commander of Joint Task Force Guantanamo, commanded the 6th Fleet and the NATO Striking Force. He served in every geographic component command area of operations across the globe. Admiral Harris's staff assignments include several on the office of the Chief of Naval Operations, and one of those jobs was as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Communication Networks. He's a veteran of West. He also served as the assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs in that capacity in 2011 to 2013. He traveled the globe as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs personal representative working with the Secretary of State. He holds a Master's of Public Administration from the John F. Kennedy School at Harvard and a Master's in National Security Studies from Georgetown. Let's give a warm welcome to Admiral Harris. So let's give it up one more time for the sponsors, uh, which allow us all to get together here in San Diego. So thanks, Pete, uh, for that generous introduction. Uh, I know you took a lot of risk inviting me uh, back here to speak, almost as much risk as I took being introduced by a service warfare officer. Most speakers use the brief moments that they're being introduced uh, as a final opportunity to prepare themselves to face their audience. You know, one last prayer, perhaps, but not me. Instead, I listen very carefully to how I'm being introduced. Benjamin Franklin once concluded an introduction of our second president, John Adams, by saying Adams was always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes absolutely out of his mind. So I'm always worried that if I don't pay attention, uh, I'll take the podium after an introduction uh, like Admiral Daly gave me, and the first words out of my mouth will be, thanks, Pete, for that generous introduction. So as I look across this room, I can't help but think that there's more brain power packed into this one space than anywhere else in the world at any time, except perhaps that memorable moment in uh, Norfolk when Admiral Gortney ate lunch alone. So I'm supposed to... I was going to recognize uh, Admirals Greenert, uh, Moran, Winnefeld, and Fogo, who were supposed to be here this morning until they heard that I was speaking. So let me instead acknowledge uh, Admiral Gortney, uh, and again, Admiral Daly, uh, and, uh, and we're very proud of all the work that you've done uh, with the Institute, Pete. Also, General Shea, uh, General Lawrence, and the AVSEA team, uh, who's uh, the co-sponsor of this event. So fellow flag and general officers, senior enlisted leaders, captains of industry, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor to be back here in America's finest city to again address this incredible group and our industry partners 
patriots all. And a special shout out again to the Naval Institute and AFSEA. I'm a proud member of both for hosting this event and for challenging all of us to think about the vital nexus between emerging technology and military operations. Now, when I wore the uniform of our nation's Navy, I used to say the three great ships fly the seven seas, scholarship, leadership, and relationship. It's the noble mission of the Naval Institute and AFSEA to encourage leadership and scholarship in its members and the greater national security community of interest. I would not have become a flag officer without the relationship that I had and have with the Naval Institute. And I would not have succeeded in my first three-star job as the OPNAV N6, the deputy CNO for communication networks, now talk about a fish out of water, without the relationship that I had with AFSEA. In public speaking, we're taught never to lead with an apology, but I'm gonna do so anyway. I'm sorry that I didn't bring any cool props with me today, like the Google Glass I wore when I addressed this conference in 2014, or the drones and robots I used for another AFC event in Hawaii. So this time, no wearable optical devices, no drones, no robots, just words. So let's use some of those words. Ladies and gentlemen, I want everyone here to close your eyes and visualize. Come on now, close your eyes and visualize. Visualize someone taller than me, a man with broader shoulders than mine, upon which he carries the weight of the world, a man with the steely eyes of a combat-tested infantryman with the nerves to match, a man who, when he speaks, he does so with gravitas and authority, and the world sits up and listens. Now, open your eyes. Nope, none of the above just me. We tried to get that guy to come to speak with you this morning, but pressing events precluded Secretary Austin from being here, so you got me instead. Story of my life, number two, call sign backup. Folks, this symposium could not be more timely. Ukraine is hot. The PRC is on the march. North Korea is, once again, launching missiles and acting up. And last week, the Biden administration released its new Indo-Pacific strategy. This strategy's bold end state is nothing less than a free and open Indo-Pacific that's connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. Importantly, it recognizes that America's single greatest asymmetric strength is our network of security alliances and partnerships. Its key tenets include modernizing our bilateral treaty alliances with Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and Thailand, advocating our major defense partnership with India, and building the defense capacity of partners in South and Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. This is juice worth the squeeze. There's no better way for me to begin this year of the tiger than to share with you my thoughts on the importance of the Indo-Pacific region through the twin lenses of my experiences in Hawaii and in South Korea. I'll give you a tour to horizon about the region in general against the backdrop of the U.S.-South Korea alliance and amid the great challenges posed by the People's Republic of China. Now, as I've said on countless occasions in uniform and in mufti, relationships matter and alliances matter. They are the most integral element of U.S. foreign policy. In fact, President Biden has called alliances our greatest asset. It's a powerful statement that the first overseas trip by this administration was to the Indo-Pacific region when the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense visited Japan and South Korea last year. The Secretary has made clear in a joint op-ed in the Washington Post that alliances are vital to our national security. They deliver for the American people. In my opinion, this guidance underscores that when working with allies, give and take is preferred to slash and burn. Now, case in point, the almost 69-year-old U.S.-South Korea alliance was forged during a devastating conflict. It has stood the test of time. It's mind-boggling boggling to consider how much has changed in the world in general, Northeast Asia in particular, and the Korean Peninsula especially since 1953. Some changes have been for the better, such as South Korea's miraculous growth into an economic 
a cultural powerhouse, a high-tech innovation nation, which is leading by example in the battle against COVID-19. As of today, Korea has experienced a little more than 1.4 million cases and a total tad a little over 7,000 deaths since the pandemic began two years ago. Meanwhile, after a promising September and October, trend lines went completely in the wrong direction in the U.S. and Europe, fueled by the Omicron variant, especially for the unvaccinated. And only now is there finally some cause for optimism. Even so, we reached a truly awful milestone this month. 900,000 Americans have died of COVID. 900,000. That's more than the combined tally of American military killed in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Combined. Staggering. And we'll be over a million deaths by spring. Now, Korea's approach on COVID-19 has been lauded rightly so as a global model. They have one-sixth the population of the United States and one one-hundred-and-thirtieth the number of COVID deaths. It's not that complicated. Follow the rules and follow the science. Unless you believe that vaccinations will inject a tracking device in your arm or you get your medical advice from talk radio and your, and your meds from veterinarians. As South, Korea has as South Korea has changed and developed over the years, so too has our alliance. This alliance is dynamic, a multidimensional partnership reinforced by shared values, shared concerns, and shared economic interests, underpinned by the deepest of people-to-people -people ties. It has lasted generations and will continue to thrive for generations to come as long as we together nurture it, resource it, and remain committed to it. Now, naturally, there are disagreements within the alliance, which is to be expected in any co-equal relationship spanning seven decades. The U.S. and South Korea continue to work at the highest levels on issues such as fair trade, defense cost sharing, and the future command structure of Korean and American forces on the peninsula. I'm pleased that our countries finally reached an agreement on cost sharing last year, after I left, I should add, maybe it was me all along. It was a slog getting to that point, admittedly, but there's much to celebrate. A salute to the negotiating teams from both countries, to my former colleagues at State and at the embassies in Seoul, and to U.S. Forces Korea. Now, while our relationship with South Korea is a very good news story indeed, other changes have been for the worse, such as North Korea's unrelenting pursuit of nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them and Pyongyang's unrelenting aggression against South Korea. Now, while we hope for diplomacy with North Korea to be successful, we must recognize that hope alone is not a course of action. The U.S.-South Korea joint military training is designed to support peace on the peninsula and in the region, while ensuring that we maintain readiness and never let our guard down. The quest for dialogue with the North must never be made at the expense of our ability to respond to threats from the North. Dialogue and military readiness must go hand in hand. Idealism must be rooted in realism. So far this year, the North has launched seven missiles of increasing complexity. This doesn't look to me like a path toward peace on the peninsula. I firmly believe that we must not relax sanctions or reduce joint military exercises just to get North Korea to return to the negotiating table. This is a tried and true road to failure. If exercises and sanctions are reduced as an outcome of negotiations, fine. That's why we have negotiations. But let's not give them away beforehand. And regarding the much discussed end of war declaration, we should ask ourselves what will change the day after such a declaration is signed. The armistice will still be extant. Our treaty obligations to defend South Korea will still be extant, and North Korea's missile, nuclear, and conventional capabilities will still be extant. Plus, North Korea shows little interest in such a declaration and every interest in ratcheting up provocations. It's unfortunate that North Korea has not yet embraced the opportunity presented by three U.S. and three South Korean presidential summits. The Biden administration has made it clear that the U.S. seeks negotiations with North Korea without preconditions. 
The U.S. continues to seek transformed relations between Washington and Pyongyang, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, and the complete denuclearization of North Korea, all of which were agreed upon in Singapore in 2018, and could set the conditions for a brighter future for the North Korean people. Now, while I believe that Singapore was far from a perfect agreement, it brought us to a place that we've never been before. I also believe that, sadly, North Korea missed a great opportunity in Hanoi, and they likely won't get another chance like that. So ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, Kim Jong-un or KGU wants four things. Sanctions relief, keep his nukes, split the U.S.-South Korea alliance, and dominate the peninsula. During last year's 8th Workers' Party Congress, KGU talked about strengthening North Korea's nuclear deterrent. Last March, the IAEA expressed concerns about the trajectory of North Korea's nuclear program, and last May, the U.S. intelligence community formally assessed that KGU views nuclear weapons as the ultimate deterrent against foreign intervention. Folks, that doesn't sound to me like he's willing to give them up anytime soon. I say it often, and I can't say it enough. The U.S. is fully committed to the alliance, and it stands firmly with South Korea. This is important because, as you all know well, North Korea and the PRC will continuously test the resolve of this relationship and will seek ways to weaken our strong ties and sow doubt in order to divide us. And now, a word or three about the People's Republic of China or the PRC. In Seoul, I was often asked whether South Korea is being forced to choose between its only security ally on the one hand and its number one trading partner on the other. This is a false narrative designed to sow doubt about the history and strength of our alliance. The U.S. made its choice in 1950 when we chose to defend South Korea against communist aggression from the North. South Korea made its choice in 1953 to formally ally with the U.S. Moreover, when choosing between not upsetting Beijing and standing up for its own and alliance interests, it's worth considering the entirety of cooperation between the United States and South Korea. The U.S., for example, is the second largest investor in South Korea after Japan. Most assume it's the PRC. Combined with Japan, we have 40 percent of foreign direct investment in South Korea. China's is in single digits. The China market is attractive for sure, but the Latte Corporation story shows the downside of focusing too much on simple market access. The U.S has partnered well with China on several important fronts. But Washington and Beijing fundamentally disagree on how to approach the current international order. The PRC doesn't keep its word from its treaty with the British on Hong Kong to its human rights abuses against the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, and others, and to its attempts at commercial espionage and its quest to first isolate, then dominate Taiwan. As I testified when I was a PACOM commander, I believe the PRC seeks hegemony, not only in East Asia, but in greater Asia and beyond. The PRC wants to set the rules for the region, indeed the world, which is why it's essential that free nations exercise vigilance. This is why the U.S. has made it clear that we reject foreign policy based on leverage and dominance and seek instead to strengthen relationships based on respect, equal footing, and fair exchange. The U.S. believes in partnership economics. We won't weaponize debt. Instead, we strive to build environments which foster good, productive market economies. We encourage every country to work in its own enlightened self-interest to protect its own sovereignty. Now, while the how-to regarding dealing with Beijing was certainly evolved with the Biden administration, I note that the fundamental understanding of the PRC has not. Consider the Secretary Blinken testified at his confirmation hearing that the previous administration's tougher approach is right. That's what's happening in Xinjiang is genocide, and the democracy is being trampled in Hong Kong. Secretary Austin testified that he's focused on the pacing threat posed by the PRC, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. The administration's new Indo-Pacific strategy specifically supports an environment in which Taiwan's future is determined peacefully 
in accordance with the wishes and best interests of Taiwan's people. Taiwan is democratic, an economic and innovation powerhouse, a global force for good. I've called for ending the 50-year U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity in favor of strategic clarity, and I do so again today. My successor at Indo-Pacific Command testified before Congress last year that the PRC could invade Taiwan in six years. That's 2027. That's inside the FIDA. We ignore Admiral Davidson's warning at our peril. Since the end of World War II, the network of U.S. alliances and partnerships has been at, a core, at the core of a stable and peaceful Indo-Pacific. No country can shape the future of the region in isolation, and no vision for the region is complete without a robust network of sovereign countries cooperating to secure their collective interests. This is why trilateral cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and Japan is so important. It's crucial for our three nations to work together to enhance our security cooperation and preserve the international rules-based order. Notwithstanding the current tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, and these are not insignificant, the reality is that no important security or economic issue in the region can be addressed successfully without both Seoul and South Korea's and Japan's active involvement. This is why I'm encouraged by the outcome of last week's trilateral foreign ministerial meeting in Hawaii, where the three leaders condemned the recent flurry of North Korean missile tests. The South Korean foreign minister went further and said that ongoing disagreements between Seoul and Tokyo would not affect cooperation on North Korea. Even so, I was disappointed that South Korea's president did not travel to Tokyo for the Summer Olympics last year to meet with his counterpart, and that neither had a bilateral meeting during last fall's climate change COP26 conference in Scotland. Not pointing fingers, just opining that these were missed opportunities. Now, what about the Quad? And that's the informal grouping of like-minded democracies, the U.S., Australia, Japan, and India. I'm a big fan and booster of the Quad. I called for its resurgence at the inaugural Rosina Dialogue in New Delhi in 2016. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan called it the foundation upon which to build a substantial U.S. policy in the region. No surprise, a strong, reliable Quad is an important component of the new Indo-Pacific strategy. I recently began calling for the establishment of a Quad Secretariat headquartered somewhere in the region to coordinate among Quad members on what issues to take on, and perhaps to get at the question of how new members can join. You know, in college football, the Big Ten has 14 teams, and the Big 12 has 10 teams. There's nothing that says the Quad has to have only four teams. Now, let me be clear. Let me be clear. The Quad is not NATO, nor will it ever be a NATO. It's a grouping of like-minded democracies who would share a common outlook on the region's opportunities, challenges, and dangers but it's not a defense pact. Now, the new Australia, United Kingdom, U.S., or AUKUS, is a defense pact, and I, for one, am all for it, and I'm excited by it. I cannot wait to see a nuclear submarine under Australian colors underway somewhere in the Indo-Pacific. I don't believe it'll take decades, as some have said, if the three countries put our hearts and minds and resources to the task. After all, we put a man on the moon in eight years and developed a COVID vaccine in less than one year. We can do this. So ladies and gentlemen, I've talked too long. I'm reminded of that great baseball story where the home team is getting shellacked. The manager walks out of the dugout and directly to, it goes directly to the mound and takes the ball from the pitcher. But coach, I'm not tired, says the pitcher. Yes, son, I know, says the coach, but the outfielders sure are. So for all you outfielders out there, let me close with the following observation. America's strength depends on the synergy between those brave women and men who volunteer to wear the cloth of the nation to defend America wherever our freedom is in jeopardy and our partners in business and industry who support them and provide them with the best tools to get the job done. Partners like each of you here today. I thank you for all for what you do every day to ensure that our military and our nation remain ready to fight and to win. May God bless the men and women of our armed forces. May God bless the great organizations like Naval Institute and AFCEA 
And last but certainly not least, may God bless America. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. I think there's a microphone here, so. Uh, but if you if you don't want to walk, if you don't want to walk that long walk, just stand up and ask real loudly. Okay, I'll break the ice. Pete Daly, Naval Institute. From your perspective, uh, Admiral, from PAC Fleet, and then going up to Camp Smith, and then over to the Korean Peninsula, as you look back now, what is the thing, I'll stand back, what is the thing that you think is the capability that you wished you had now that you weren't advocating for then? What have you learned from that perspective of those three positions? Yeah, thanks, Pete, for that great question. Uh, you know, we had a little of, we had a little of a lot of things, but we didn't have enough of any of the things that I want to talk about in response to your question. Uh, blessing missile defense, missile defense. You know, we had a little of it here, we had a little of it there, we had Thad in Guam, we had Patriot in different places, and all this other stuff. Well, we didn't have an overarching connected architecture for ballistic missile defense, uh, such that we don't have, such that we, we're not limited by fixed sensor to shooter uh, uh, connections. That's one thing. And, and I'm, 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 I'm uh, happy to see that there, uh, there, there are advancements being made in that regard uh, through uh, uh, MDA uh, as, a, as a lead and through industry uh, who are uh, fighting hard to create, op to create uh, tool sets that, that will enable uh, a more uh, robust architecture for, for uh, missile defense. Um, I think also, you know, we're self-limited uh, in, uh, in our ability to communicate with each other. So I'm gonna talk about this in the next thing that we're all doing, the, this moderated panel that, that I'll be uh, uh, talking about uh, that. But what I'm getting at is, you know, when I was, uh, when I was at uh, Indo-PACOM, uh, I, I couldn't go to my GAO, my global access list, and and reach out to find somebody in the Army. Uh, you know, I had, to, I had to like make a phone call first, which sort of defeats the whole purpose of it. And when I was in uh, the embassy in Seoul, I couldn't talk to the Army, U.S. Forces Korea on CIPRANET because we didn't have CIPRANET in the State Department. We have something called ClassNet. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we are our own worst enemies in this case. We've met the enemy and it is us. So, uh, you know, these are some of the things that, that I think that we need to work hard to overcome, both from the uniform side and from the industry side, uh, so that uh, you know, we, can, we can fight together like we're supposed to uh, in a joint way. Okay. Hey, I'm not gonna troll for questions up here, folks. I'm, no. yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go have another one of those so, great muffins. So we asked you to a West conference. You've talked about the Indo-Pacific, and we thank you. But could you offer your opinion on the current situation with Ukraine and Russia? Yeah, so I, I'm afraid to answer that question because it could change in about an hour, right? I mean, this is supposed to be the day. Uh, I do note that cyber attacks have already happened. Uh, there's, there's been some news reporting, which, which to me, is exactly what we see in our joint military exercises. You know, the white cell injects something that says, you know, news reports that says that there's a, a terrorist attack in some part of the world. Well, shoot, that just happened yesterday, right? TASS reported that there's a terrorist attack in eastern Ukraine. Uh, you know, white cell injects, Pete and I were talking about this earlier, white cell injects uh, a note that says, uh, Russian fighters have overflown U.S. positions in, in some part of the world. That just happened. U, uh, uh, Russian fighters overflew our uh, forces in Syria. So, I mean, give it an hour and this thing could change completely. But I do think it's important uh, to note uh, that the United States can walk and chew gum at the same time. And diplomacy uh, is being uh, 
uh, employed to its greatest extent. Don't know if it'll be successful. Time would tell uh, in that regard. Uh, I think that what we've done with Ukraine and upgunning them uh, through our assistance programs is terrific. I think we should have done that all along. I think we're about 10, 10 years too late on that, uh, but we're, we're doing a lot recently uh, in the past year, uh, and that's important. And the fact that I'm here instead of that big tall guy uh, is another case in point that, that, that the right people are, are where they need to be uh, to try to get at that issue. I'm John Cohut from uh, Galt here in San Diego. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to hear you and insightful to hear you speak, so thank you for stepping in. Um, competition for energy seems to have been causes of uh, wars in the past and uh, possibly uh, in the theater you just talked about. Can you talk about uh, competition for energy in the Western Pacific and how that might uh, play out? Yeah, so uh, I used to show a map of the world, and I had a big circle around uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, countries there, the landmass. And I made the point that more people live in that circle than the whole world uh, today. And by 2050, more people live, will live in that circle uh, than the whole globe. Uh, and so, uh, and, and when you have that amount of people living in that relatively small area, uh, of the world, you're going to have those competitions uh, that are that we see play out today. Competition for energy, for food, uh, for uh, for, for uh, all kinds of things, and the threat posed by pandemics, which we're seeing play out today as well. So, um, energy vital, obviously. Uh, I think the new energy sources are important. Uh, you know, uh, through uh, batteries and that kind of thing. But we're going to see other related shortages, uh, shortages of uh, lithium um, and other rare earths. Uh, I don't think there's enough uh, uh, wind power or, uh, or solar power to power the energy demands of the world. Uh, I'm a proponent of nuclear power. I think it's clean. Uh, and, and we ought to return to that in the United States uh, as well. Uh, but I think that you are right when you suggest that the competition for energy uh, is, is likely to fuel the next conflict. Certainly in, in the Indo-Pacific, we see that competition play out in the South China Sea uh, and, and all of the competing claims there and the uh, moves afoot by the PRC to retain that. It's crazy claims that the entire South China Sea uh, is part of uh, the PRC. So, you know, I think we'll see that play out. I think also we'll see um, a competition for water uh, play out as well. We're seeing it play out politically inside the United States. I live in Colorado, and we see that today. But we're going to see it play out uh, in, a, in a more uh, uh, combat way, uh, more kinetic way, I think, uh, abroad uh, over time. Yeah. Guy in the back. Admiral. Can, you, can you hear me now? Admiral, in your address, you mentioned strategic clarity for, for Taiwan, and I was wondering if that could include or should include the United States normalizing or reestablishing its relations with Taiwan. If so, what do you think the impacts of such a recognition would be? Yeah, so when I, when I talk about strategic clarity, I'm not talking about backing away from the one China policy. I think we can have both. And, and, uh, and we are driven not by a treaty, but we're driven by the law, the Taiwan Relations Act in 19, of 1979. So that's the law. And this sets the framework, the left and right limits of our relationship with Taiwan and our obligations to Taiwan. One of those obligations is not the obligation to defend Taiwan. I want to be clear about that. So the Taiwan Relations Act specifically uh, uh, delineates those responsibilities of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan uh, and uh, what we will and won't do. Uh, I do think, uh, but now I want to shift to strategic ambiguity and strategic clarity. So strategic ambiguity is a policy where, where, whereby we as a nation are ambiguous on whether we would defend Taiwan, not whether we're obligated to defend Taiwan, but whether we would defend Taiwan if the PRC forcibly uh, tried to bring Taiwan back uh, into its fold. The Taiwan Relations Act says we would support a peaceful reconciliation 
across the uh, Taiwan Strait. Uh, you know, if, if Taiwan wants to become part of the PRC or not. If it was done peacefully, we'd be all for that, and that's the law, uh, and that's, uh, that's our obligation. Strategic ambiguity is a policy that has served us well for 50 years. And by that, I mean that uh, we have not said what we would do. So we have kept the PRC guessing, and on the other hand, we've kept Taiwan guessing so they won't declare independence. But I think the time for strategic ambiguity is over. I think in 2021, 2022, where we are today, I think it's important that we be clear to the PRC what we would do if they were to attack Taiwan to forcibly reintegrate them uh, into Greater China. I think it's an obligation that we have to the Taiwanese, the Taiwan people, so they would understand what we would do if the PRC were to attack them. And most importantly, I think it's important that the American people understand what we would do if the PRC attacks Taiwan. Now, I say this in an academic way because I'm not suggesting that we end strategic ambiguity by saying we would defend Taiwan. You know, maybe the decision is that we won't defend Taiwan. But I'm saying that we, we owe it to the PRC, to the Taiwanese, and most importantly to the American people that we be clear on what we would do. So in 2022, we ought to be clear on, uh, as to what we do. Now, on a personal level, I have my own opinion of, of, of what we should do if Taiwan is invaded by the PRC. As I said in my remarks, Taiwan is a, a, a global force for good. It's an innovation nation. It's an economic powerhouse, uh, and it's a great country. You know, I, I used to talk, if you had a if you had a, 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 a handful of clay and you were going to mold a country, you were going to build a country, you know, what would those attributes be if, if we were going to do it? Well, I think we'd want a country that's democratic. We want a country that likes the United States. We want a country that's economically strong. And we want a country that's a global force for good. And guess what? We have one of those, and it's called Taiwan. Good morning, Admiral. My name is Brian McGrath. Uh, Regarding the United States Indo-Pacific strategy released last week, uh, it appears a little light on hard power, and to the extent that hard power is discussed, it is capacity of friends and allies. When it comes to our own forces, it is concepts of operations, posture, and the like. No discussion of capacity. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that the objective of the Indo-Pacific strategy is not to talk about the strength of the U.S. military and our capacity. Uh, it's, to, it's to talk about how we value alliances, partnerships, and relationships, you know, those things I've talked about in my remarks. I think there are other documents that will get at the specific issue that you talked about, the description of American power, hard power, uh, and, and our military capacity. The national military strategy is one of those. It has not come out. National security strategy is one of those. It has not come out. The Indo-Pacific strategy is focused on how we are going to deal with the threats, opportunities, and challenges uh, in that region. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. It's Simon Polito from Microsoft. Sir, as we start to um, fight the cyber uh, warfare, what are the top three priorities as a former commander that you would want to have in your command and control center? I'd like to be able to turn my computer on, and now I have to ask my aide to help me because I don't have one now. So uh, that'd be one thing. I, I think realistically, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't say the top three things. I'll, I'll, I would say the top one thing, which is an effective, a truly effective uh, cyber cop, you know, common operating picture. So that I could look as a, as a combatant commander, I could look and understand uh, the strength of my networks throughout the Indo-Pacific and back to Washington, right? I mean, that's important as well, maybe more important in many ways. Uh, the strength of that network at all of its nodes. And we don't have that today. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, Paul Frittenberg's here somewhere, you know, he was building something like that to make that work just for, just for Indo-PACOM, uh, you know, but if you're sitting back in Washington, you know, who's, who's looking at the whole network? And not just the Navy's network, 
or not just the Army's network or the Marines' network or the Air Force's network, Space Force's network, but the global network. You know, who's looking at this uh, holistically uh, and can depict it away in a way that, that non-technical folks like me can understand it and then make those decisions uh, that would ensue from it. So I think that's the most important thing that I lacked uh, and I wished I had uh, then. Good morning, Admiral. Alan Osherak. Building on your comments earlier about Taiwan and energy in the region, uh, we have a situation in Hawaii with the Red Hill complex. It's often been said that the Achilles heel of our warfighting capabilities in the Pacific is refueling. The Marine Corps has their new strategy under General Berger to essentially have an island hopping campaign. How would you envision refueling our Navy, Marines, and Air Force is operating in support of Taiwan or near China. We have a, a strategic gap, if you will, in between our ability to refuel, let's say, in the Philippines or in Singapore or far north in Korea. Would you envision perhaps we establish a capability in Vietnam, let's say, or in some of the Pacific Islands? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, clearly an important issue that's being addressed by Pacific Fleet and by uh, indo pacom uh, I know the CTF Ta Commander Task Force 73 in Singapore um, is dealing with that issue. Uh, and, you know, we, we have uh, uh, partners and, and friends uh, in the Central and South Pacific that we could rely on, uh, that we could, uh, uh, you know, build infrastructure there. We have not yet. Uh, and, and you can't build a Red Hill complex overnight um, and, uh, and all of that. So I, I know that it's, it's being addressed. Uh, I don't know the specifics of that. You'd have to ask uh, maybe Admiral Paparo at lunch. So you can tell him I told you to ask him. Feel free. <laughs> okay, got it back. Hi, uh, Andrew Nelson. So um, the Indo-Pacific strategy you cited, the, the last part of the action plan is to support open, resilient, secure, and trustworthy technologies. Um, and I think part of that is uh, taking advantage of commercial and global supply chain to get the most innovative, best technology faster in the warfighter's hands. But part of that is securing the supply chain and adapting that technology so it's appropriate for, for our purposes in the DOD. So my question is, uh, what do you wish industry were doing to help support and close that gap? And what do you think about the kind of that, that balance, I guess? Yeah, I think the industry is doing what industry needs to do. So I'm not, uh, um, I'm not seeing a deficiency in industry's uh, ability to create uh, and to, to deliver possible solutions to this issue of trusted networks writ large. Where I see the, the, the shortfall is, is, is in the DOD side of the house, where our acquisition process is, is too long, uh, and where the, the wickets through which we go through, uh, both on the industry side and on the warfare side, uh, are too big. So we need to work on the acquisition side, I think, uh, on the DO, within the DOD, within the government, uh, and, and not uh, worry too much about industry uh, who is uh, not hamstrung by self-imposed limitations. Thank you. Good morning, Admiral uh, Jeff Shogel with Task and Purpose. How would you say the PLA ground forces perform tactically compared to U.S. troops? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question coming uh, to a Navy guy who does read Task and Purpose regularly, by the way. Um, they're not tested, for one thing. I mean, they're tested in small, small skirmishes, uh, you know, India uh, and the Northern Frontier area and stuff like that. Uh, but they're not tested very large like the U.S. ground forces, the Marine Corps and the Army. Uh, I, I think their, their ability to deliver those ground forces uh, to the point of uh, need uh, is severely limited. Uh, you know, you, one of the lessons that came out of Afghanistan, uh, the, the American withdrawal of, uh, out of Af Afghanistan, uh, the debacle of our withdrawal, was, however, the success of the airlift that was, uh, that was provided. What other country in the world could do that? Could airlift 120,000 people 
uh, on, on no notice at all. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that that lesson is being examined closely by our potential adversaries. And I don't see the PRC as having that capability to deliver those ground forces uh, anywhere in the world uh, at the level uh, that the America can. So that's an issue. Uh, I think if the, if the, if the uh, China, PRC mainland was attacked, uh, their ground forces would probably do well. Uh, but, but uh, you know, to, to go to some other point in the globe and fight a sustained combat against uh, uh, military forces like the Army and the Marines and our allied uh, military ground forces, uh, I think would be, uh, they'd be at a disadvantage. The other thing is, you know, our, our Army and, and Marine ground forces are not going to fight uh, uh, by themselves. They're going to be enabled by the joint force. Uh, they'll be part of a joint force. And I don't see that, that joint architecture uh, robustly uh, uh, in, ex in, in existence uh, in the PRC military. So, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one final question. Got a bit of a hot mic here, Admiral. Uh, thanks for your time. I'm Jeff Zizulowitz with Navy Times. Uh, you know, turning to the fluid situation with Ukraine, you know, there's some critics out there that say, uh, you know, we're seeing kind of a, a retrenchment of, uh, you know, American presence globally, um, you know, from, from Afghanistan to, um, you know, a lack of more of a, a presence in Ukraine. If, if Russia does invade Ukraine, do you think that sends a message to the PRC one way or the other about what we would do, you know, should Taiwan be invaded? Yeah. I think the more important question, I, let me answer the question that I, that I thought you were going to ask me and, and ignore the question that you did ask me. <laughs> the, the, the question isn't what China will, what the PRC will do if Russia invades Ukraine. The question is what will the PRC do if the U.S. does nothing if Russia invades Ukraine. In other words, it's, it's how we respond as a country to Russia's invasion of Ukraine will determine in some measure, figure into some calculus uh, of the PRC and uh, its decision on Taiwan. Right. Does that embolden the invasion? Well, I mean, it, it depends on what we do, right? If, if, if Russia invades Ukraine, what, does, what will the United States do? Well, we won't know. Again, give it a, give it a couple of hours and we might know. But we, we don't know. But depending on what we do, that could or could not embolden the PRC's future actions against Taiwan. So we, it depends on what we do. We, we remain at the center of the equation of the PRC's decision calculus on Taiwan. It's not the Russian action in, in, uh, in isolation. It's what America does regarding that action that will influence what the PRC does regarding its actions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much. Don't go away until we give you a small token of our appreciation. We have the Sailor's Bookshelf written by this guy, uh, Jim Stavridis. It's a Naval Institute Press book with an AFSEA bookmark, and on behalf of FCA International and the Naval Institute, we truly appreciate the time you took to come here today and kick off our conference. And we also thank uh, Hitachi Ventara Federal for sponsoring. Thank you very much. Let's give Admiral Harris one more hand. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into a networking break in the exhibit hall sponsored by AppGate. We hope that you'll be able to join us from 4 to 6 p.m. tonight in Ballroom 20D for an awards presentation and reception. In addition to AFSIA and U.S. Naval Institute Awards, we will present the 2022 Copernicus Awards, which recognize Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard individuals, both active duty and civilian, who have demonstrated sustained superior performance in a C4I IT-related job. That event is open to everyone.
The Naval Institute will be hosting book signings throughout the week at their exhibit booth, which is number 2225. You can look in the app for the full schedule of authors. Additionally, you can join or renew your Naval Institute membership during the conference and receive a free book. You can also learn more about the Institute's comprehensive campaign, the power to inform, convene, and inspire, and how your donations help our help keep our sea services the finest in the world. Again, stop by the Naval Institute booth, number 2225. At booth 1825, FC is offering a special one-year discounted rate to new members who join us here on Side Out West. Stop by today, take advantage of this special offer. Existing members should also stop by to renew your membership learn about the many member benefits FCA has to offer, and to find out more about FCA events and chapters worldwide. The week's first panel are our warfighting communities adapting rapidly enough to meet the new warfighting challenges. We'll begin at 10.15 a.m. Thank you to Finn Cantieri Marine Group for their sponsorship of the panel. There are also presentations in the Navy Information Warfare Theater the Marine Corps Theater, the West Theater, and the Innovation Showcase throughout the day. Enjoy the break, enjoy everything West has to offer, and again, welcome back to San Diego. <laughs>